Let's pray real quick, see if we can reverse the trend. Press Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. I am going to uh, regard myself as a heathen by praying for the nice weather, because that's not really what I mean. I pray that you just watch over us as we study your word today, that you would bring cool weather, that, that we can actually enjoy the calendar. I pray that you just watch over the ones that aren't here, Lord, that might be traveling ones that aren't here, whether it be for health reasons or whatever, that you just keep them ever present in our minds. Allow us to study your word today, Lord. Take something with us that is beneficial to the course of the week. And for the ones that cross the street, hear the message, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would have a freedom that, that is unparalleled, that you would allow us to do it in such a fashion that we bring honor and glory to your name with our lifestyle, our speech patterns, and our life in our neighborhoods. We ask these things in Christ's name. Okay. First off, you got a verse, right? Yeah. My eyeballs on. Hi. Good morning. Mm -hmm. uh, you got First Thessalonians four nine. <laughs> Your Bibles will say different things, but the old King James says. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught by or of God to love one another. It is a declarative statement made by Christ when people are asking Him questions through Paul because they did not understand what was going on at times as to why they should love somebody. Um, any of you have enemies lists? Any of you brave enough to raise your hand that has an enemy's list? Okay, because the world does, you know. You're, you're one of them. You're probably at the top of the list. But I need you to understand something, that if you have a Jew, a Gentile, is this a joke? <laughs> it was a Jew. It was a Jew. Were they in a boat? <laughs> And heathen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that when they all have a, a come to Jesus moment and they step out in salvation, this verse is one of the first things that is applied to your new spirit. How to love somebody that is not necessarily in your wheelhouse for loving. Okay? That's what this is about. Because it talks about concerning something. And if you'll do me a favor, drop down there where it talks about concerning. It is, when used at the beginning of a sentence, it denotes an absolute sense. This is going to be something that Jesus Christ can say, God can say, the Holy Spirit can say, and Paul can say in authority that this is something that God does not overlook. It is not ever a chance of you coming to Jesus Christ and not having the ability inserted into you to love something or somebody that is not normally loved by you or an individual. Alright? That's the intent of this when it talks about absolute sense. And then when it talks about the next one is brotherly love. What's the word that you see there in Greek? Philadelphia. Why is it, why is it that one first and the other one second? Pay attention to it. Alright? Here's how you're going to exhibit your love to another Christian is what it's talking about. This is New Testament love of Christians one to another out of common spiritual life. You all have the same Christ. You have warm affections and feelings for them. So in case you thought that I think that there are no feelings involved in Christianity, this dispels it right there. I have feelings for Christians that I do not have for the world. I will go out of my way a whole lot more for a Christian than I will for the world. That is incumbent upon my salvation experience. I have a natural bent now in my spirit to deal with your problems, my problems, your blessings, my blessings, so that when I encounter those things, I'm doing it in Christ which is beneficial to you, beneficial to me, and definitely beneficial to Christ because it glorifies the Father because that is not a natural reaction of you. 
Okay? And as it keeps on going, talks about all the different things. I don't need to write to you. You know why? Paul was a prolific writer. This is not a category where he thought he ever had to lift a pen to justify what the Lord did in somebody's life because he knew exactly what the category would be. It would be brotherly love and it would always be incumbent upon the Lord to insert that brotherly love into anybody that stepped into Jesus Christ. Period. That's why when you have a tiff with another brother in Christ, it is incumbent upon you to go repair the tiff, whether you were the recipient of it or you instigated it. Okay? That is how you continue your walk, and that's how you continue your walk in a problem that may have arisen. Now, here's the deal with that. You don't do it of your own volition. You do it by prompting. You do it by categorical insert inserting where you need to when the Holy Spirit tells you to do it. It could just be your walk that would influence that situation. It does not have to be words. Okay? If somebody's done something to you and you just all you need to do is quote unquote love them in Christ, then that's how you do it. Whatever that may be. It may be keeping your mouth shut when you have an opportunity to flap your gums. Okay. Next part of it tells you exactly how this comes about and it is a word that is literally translated because it says God in the first part of it and the second part of it is teaching. Okay? And I think I got that. It should be TH, not PH. I don't I got that one messed up. See where it says PH there on your thing? Make that a TH. My bad. Because that says God taught. That's what the two Greek words combined together mean. All right, And it's talking about what is literally done by God Himself because of what is in His nature. A reparation of a, of a relationship always has extra things with it. How many times have you repaired something with somebody and a floodgate of memories and things you wanted to tell that individual come crashing back because you've repaired the connection? That is not unusual. Okay. So just so that you realize there are both sides of that, that program. And it talks about in John 6, 4, 45, which talks about taught of God. And then the other one is in Isaiah 54, 13. It talks about the fact that if you walk the walk, God is going to teach your children what they need to know. And a lot of that teaching is going to be because of your walk. You're going to be a walking encyclopedia for somebody that wants to know Jesus Christ. That's why it, 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 it's your job to maintain your walk through, through the Spirit. That's what he's talking about. And then the last one in Michael 4 too, it just talks about the exact same thing. We're going to teach you what needs to be taught to you. God is going to do it so that you are functioning within the group. That's the whole deal. Now, the next part is, is the next part of this love thing. It says love, which is the uh, agapao one, indicating a direction of the will. This is your half of phileo. Okay? You love somebody with your feelings, but the other part of it is you have directed your will towards that individual. Alright? That is not something that human nature wants to do. That's something that a spirit does. You can do it for good reasons, or you can do it for bad reasons. That's another program altogether. But it says, finding joy in someone or something. Alright? If she has a big whoop de doo in Jesus Christ, and you come up to her and say, I am just tickled and slapped to death for you. That's your indication of a sister being blessed and you enjoying her blessing because she was blessed for no other reason. Okay? There should never be any animosity whatsoever if the Lord is blessing somebody. Not at all. That shouldn't even enter into the picture. Okay? It'll come your way, I'll guarantee you. Remember we had a saying on the board, you can't outgive God. If you do something and God knows you did it, you're going to directly benefit from it because that is His intent. That's part of His nature. What did it say in the Scriptures? If a father would give what to his child? Serpents? Yes, yeah, snakes. <laughs> okay? And then what would, what would God the Father give to you in lieu of that little scenario? 
gives you great blessings. Okay? And then the last part of this, since you're now going to indicate you've got a direction of your will, you better know what direction you're shoving your will. And that's what this next one is, one another. And it has to do with the same kind, directed towards brothers or sisters in Christ. This is the alos, not heteros word. Not a human being of a different kind, a human being that has the same indwelling Jesus Christ that you do. That's the one that you project your brotherly love to. Not anybody else. If, it, if you, they get the overflow, fine and dandy. How do you think the world realizes that you, in Christ's words, belong to Him? Because you love the brethren. Again and again and again He says that. It is a marker that is totally exclusive to a Christian functioning in Christ. Okay? And that's what this is dealing with. Did you get one of these, boss? Okay. So that's why this is put together the way it is. And understand something. You have the ability to exhibit Jesus Christ myriads of times during the course of a week. But you have to have the mindset to do it. Alright? My aggravation with drivers <laughs> is going to be legendary someday. I'll be able to write a book. I mean, even the kids say, I wonder why that guy moved over in front of you. <laughs> There's nobody else on the road. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. But my thing is, I have to, I have to be able to book that. I have to give that to Christ. Okay? It's just, it's, it's uncanny, the idiots that he puts in front of me. I probably shouldn't call them idiots. That would probably be a, that would probably be a good start. <laughs> okay? And that, but if they're in front of me, then maybe they're not in front of you. Maybe. Is that, is that, is that, maybe that's the blessing part? But at any rate, that's, this verse right here, if you would like to see why you function as a Christian properly, this is it. You've been infused with brotherly love. And there's not a thing you can do about it. You can fight it, fight it, fight it, fight it. You will be the most miserable walking Christian on planet Earth. Because that is something that you did not do yourself. It is being put into you by Christ. And it has to be acted upon. Okay? Alright. Now. Next. Where are we at? Indicator is here. Where did we finish? Page 34? That's where we finished up. Whoa, 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 whoa. 37? 42? Uh, 42. Uh, 42. Uh, 42. Uh, 42. Well, I think I'm just going to get the sentinel out. We'll start with that. How's that? Okay. Now, first off, before we get going, I scribbled, I asked you a question two weeks ago. I don't know whether you even remember the question anymore. I want you to tell me how God, or I mean how Paul looks at the church. Remember I asked you about that? Because here's what you guys are doing. You're learning, you're learning tenets of the faith as you walk through Romans. First part of it is going to be given to you as introduction and is going to show you the righteousness of God. You're up through that right now when you get to 16. You're, you're dealing with the righteousness of God. Paul is giving you indications all through his talk as to how he sees the church. Alright? And you have to understand, it's in its infancy. It is still hanging out in the temple, but doing its two sacraments on its own, which is baptism and the Lord's Supper. Those are being done in homes, in rivers, in creeks, in wheelbarrows, whatever they have to do. So that's what they're doing. Here's the deal. Paul's way of looking at the new church, and I wrote this down, I'll copy it so you can have it, but I need you to pay attention to it. Number one, Paul says he's a bond servant. We already have established what that is. That's the one with the, the thing with Bobber in their ear. All right? And he is also a minister of the people. Not to the people. Big difference. And he says the center of the church must be the people, not the clergy. Now these are words from him spoken through the first few verses of this book. Alright? 
Christ is the spiritual center, which you and I can attend, attest to. People are the human center. So anybody in a position of authority, number one, has to relinquish any power structure he has to Christ. And then after that, he has to realize that he is on equal footing with everybody that's under his tutelage. He is not elevated above them. Ever. Okay? Now, here's the other part of it. It says, this is the law of the New Testament. In case you thought laws were done away with, this is the New Testament law written by scholars and all kinds of stuff. Not organization, but the organism. That's what they call the church, an organism. Which, which conveys a sense of life, not of business. Paul is very cognizant of this. He knows Rome like the back of his hand. He knows how the laws work. He knows how authority works. All of that stuff is totally known to him. That's why he is so engrossed in Christ because it is not put together that way at all. all right? It says, not wheels and committees, but souls and Christ. Now there you go. It's not going and doing something all the time, and it is totally not a committee getting together. If there's a committee getting together, who should be the head of the committee? Christ. Christ. Nobody else. I'm not the head of this class. I've been put in a position because of whatever gift He particularly gave me. The gift is not mine. The gift belongs to you. The gift is exhibited for you. The gift is fed for you. Not for me. I can go fishing. I can go hunting. I can go hiking. I can go traveling. I can do a bazillion things besides this. But to be impressed by the Holy Spirit to do something, you are impressed to the point of addiction. You cannot get away from it. Every time you try, there's more information put in front of you than you can even imagine. Okay? Because it's going to draw you back. The, the thrill of it is going to draw you to it. Now, this is a pattern, and, and it's, here it is, and it is not always followed by the world or by the organization when it becomes that, okay? There will arise men who will win a victory over laity. This is common man. That's you and I. We're laity. Term used by Paul for that particular individual is a Nic Nicolaitan. All right? And the deeds of these men are the deeds that he talks of, of again and again and John talks of in the Revelation in 2.6, which soon will become the doctrine. So whatever these Nicolaitans, when they get into a church, and a Nicolaitan is somebody that sees themselves as an elevated individual that can only be the only one that can disperse information to you that is genuinely truth. You also know in your own heart that the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. <clears throat> Not a particular man. I can I can fail. I can be I can I can mess up. I can learn improperly. I can teach improperly. Not to be the case with the Holy Spirit. And the thing of it is is it talks about that particularly in Revelation 2.15 because it talks about a church that has been overcome by these people and is producing bad information. And when it produces bad information, you have to be careful. Did you Google Nicolaitans? Did you find it? What's it say? I did Google it. I did okay, what's it say? It's in, in your... Revelation. Is that? Okay, that's what, he's fuss, that's what he's fussing about, right? Okay, what does he talk about in that church? Well, I can tell you what it says on my Okay, go ahead. Let her rip. It says it's a her heretical, heretical, heretical. Heretical, yes. That's that means heresy. It means it's a untruth like <laughs> sect within the church that had worked out a compromise with the pagan society. They apparently taught that the spiritual liberty gave them sufficient leeway to practice idolatry and immorality. <laughs> Tradition identifies them with Nicholas. Now, how hard, how hard is it going to be to start a church that says you can go see a prostitute to get closer to God? He was actually a deacon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, we're going downhill fast. All right. You understand what I'm saying? So here's what has come into a church. So you have to pay attention to what's being taught. All right. 
You don't, you don't ever want to have somebody get... And you're, I, I, as a Christian and a functioning Christian and one that is maturing in Christ, you need to be able to spot an individual that's getting snared by that stuff. And then you go to that individual and you tell them a little bit about, you know, maybe you might not want to go that way, yada, 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 give them a little bit of doctrine, and then see what happens. Step back and let them learn. Let them figure it out. Let them test the waters. That's exactly how you came about the knowledge. And that's basically what they're talking about here. Because the thing of it is, is if you're going to have a functioning church, every other member of the church body is going to keep an eye on every other member of the church body and they're going to see your lifestyle. They're going to see if you're stumbling. They're going to see if you're <coughs> maturing like crazy. And that will benefit them, you, and the whole body. Why? Because how do you find, how did they find the right people to lead the church of Rome? They introduced doctrine to them. And as a particular individual has a gift of, of collecting knowledge or teaching, they're going to float to the surface. But they're not, no, they, they don't ever not become part of the body. But here's a gift. Now what happens, how do we, how many churches do you know that have no mercy? Okay, if I was running it, I would have to find a body in the church like Don. Okay? Because, I mean, I just hit them in the head, shove them in a the drawer, and pull them out if I need them. What does Donnie do? Donnie's the one that goes and collects the strays. The ones that are hurting. The ones that need picking up. I can tell you how to get up. I just don't help. I don't always help you up. Okay? I mean, I'm not... I'm not I, I can't do anything about it. I mean, I can apply for that job. Can you imagine me being full of mercy? When I need to tell you something? Well, I need to tell you something, but I just don't know how to tell you. It's just... You know, I know it's going to hurt your feelings and you're just going to have a really hard day and I don't give a rip. i got to tell you. Why do I have to tell you? Because that's the gift He gave me. When you disseminate doctrine, you know what He told Paul? He said, don't you ever skip any lick, any part, any any digit, any, any jot, any tittle of the Scripture. You teach the whole thing. When the bad stuff comes through, teach the bad stuff. When the good stuff's there, hang out in it if you want to, but don't forget the rest of the stuff. Okay? I mean, it's just like, how many of you always want to get good news? It's just absolutely wonderful, isn't it? Unicorns, rainbows, you know? What happens if that's all you get? And the good news becomes bad news. <laughs> and the good news becomes bad news. You get icky sweet. Oh, Jesus was with me today. Yeah, I saw your car. It looks like it's in like four pieces. What part was he with? All I'm saying is you understand it has to be the whole thing. So when you when he's talking about all these things, Nicolaitans, they took the bad news, which is you're not supposed to be fornicators, you're not supposed to be doing this and doing that. They compromised it and said, here we go, let's do this little project. Let's go ahead and say that fornication in the right setting is going to draw you closer to Christ. That church will fill up in our people. But when Paul shows up, what does he say? He tells him again and again. Understand that if you're in this category, you are a really grave chance of not inheriting the kingdom of God. You've got to have both sides of the scale. Okay. So as he's doing that, that's what we're, that's that's what they're wrestling with. Now here we got to the justice of God part, did we not? Isn't that where we got to? Page 42. All right. And you can, we'll go through it quickly because it's something that is spoken of as we go on from here. And I scribbled more stuff too because I found some other stuff. Anyway. And uh, with this thing right here, I want you to pay attention to this. All right. Because last week we talked about not being ashamed of the gospel. That was in 16. And I need you to understand something. You are a. You are a genius in God. It's hard to believe, isn't it? I know. You're a genius in Christ's eyes because you have in have, have an uh, indwelling of Him. All right. 
And the fact that you have that indwelling means you're teachable. The fact that you're teachable means you're going to mature. The fact that you're going to mature means that other people are going to benefit from your maturity. And as they benefit from your maturity, you're going to have more crises enter your life because the test is going to become greater and greater for a mature Christian all the way up to eternity because you are getting further into the kingdom of Satan as far as disruption goes. All right? So here it is. Take the gospel for a slain. There's your weapon. Gospel. What is the gospel? We already talked about it. St. Corinthians. Christ on the cross. Christ off the cross. Christ in the tomb. Christ out of the tomb. Christ on the earth. Christ in the heavens. Okay? That's basics. That's what you're taking. That's your sling. You can whoop that rascal any time. And it says, faith and repentance for the smooth stones from the brook. Now, here's the deal. This thing is loaded with stuff. This is from a gentleman by the name of Talmadge that came across and was used again and again and again by Dwight L. Moody as an individual that had a very tremendous grasp of how to put Scripture into everyday terms. Okay? I don't know where he found them. I don't know how he came about. What is it we're just talking about here? What's the brook? It's say a creek. A creek. Is that not right? What's Christ? The water. Gee, isn't that a novel idea? Now here's the guy that's putting this stuff together. So you're taking smooth stones out of living water. You're going to take sure aim. How are you going to aim? You're going to aim your doctrine at an individual that comes across your path or a group of people or a situation. And as that happens, what happens? Who's directing it? That's the part that we kind of get lost on. Okay? How many of you bow hunt? Anybody ever swung a slingshot? Okay, how, how, how do you do that? You pull back, and you got the rock in the pouch. I had a wrist rocket. That's the kind I had. The Ys are too tough on your wrist, so I got a wrist rocket. So it's resting right there with surgical tubing and a hunk of leather. Okay? The only bad part is I really felt bad the first time I dinged a bird. I didn't. I mean, I thought Was that a little bit of mercy? Just a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> but it was short-lived. So, but, but the deal is, once I turn loose of the rock, what control do I have over it? Absolutely none. Now, here's the deal. You're shooting a perfectly cylindrical steel ball, not a rock. Which means that the, all of the forces that it can work on it from the side are going to be relatively uniform as it travels through space. Correct? Okay. Now, I haven't got a clue as to what I'm talking about, but anyway, I just want you to. All right, here's the deal. As it shoots through the air, who's exerting force on it? The God that controls everything else around it. He can put it wherever He wants. And what it says, God will direct the weapon, and great Goliath will tumble before you. So how do you exert force on problems out there? You take the doctrine that you know you have, which is going to be your sling. You take your smooth stones or whatever projectile you have, which is doctrine. You're going to launch that rascal at the problem. And then you're going to step back and you're going to say, wow, I can't wait to see that rascal hit. Because that's how the program works. That's what Paul said when he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. That's why they can write later on. It never returns void. It always has a target. It is always perfect. In its, and it's hitting the target because all I'm doing, I'm just the launching pad. Okay? How many of you have let your rubber tubes get uh, dry rotted? The only part that really hurts is when the leather hits you in the cheek. Okay? Because said side came loose before said projectile was sent, and said projectile fell to the ground, and said piece of leather is on its way around the ark, and it's about to slap you right there in the side of the head. Okay? And it wouldn't be bad except for the fact that you fold the leather over, and you tie it with another piece of leather, so it's like a big old honking mace when it comes around the side, nailing you in the side of the face. Now, what does that tell me I did? I let my doctrine get... Stale, rotten. I did not keep putting it out there on a regular basis. 
That's the difference. You have to keep your sling in good stead. What would David have done had he slung that thing and one of those twines would have come loose? Whose head would have been on the spear? David's. Okay? Who directed that stone? God. So that he got the glory. That's how you're put together. That's how you instigate um, a bad day for Satan and his minions. That's the project that you work on. Now, if uh, anybody looks up Talmadge, uh -huh. be careful which one you look up. Yeah, there's a couple of them that aren't really there's a cool. James Talmadge, Talmadge who that's is an atheist. Church of Latter Day Saint. <laughs> okay. Then there's yeah. a Thomas. I'll check I and see Googled, because okay. any anyone that's associated uh, with Moody probably isn't. Is that great. was Thomas DeWitt Talmadge? Okay, there you go. With Moody, be remember that. Scribble it if you want to look at because he uses them again and again. Um, I don't even know who gave me the book. Here's the book. 1,001 Thoughts from My Library. Dwight L. Moody, and every verse that he comes across to use it, he finds somebody in his, in his sphere of influence that makes a, a common sense application of that verse. Okay? So it's really interesting when you slide through it because the thing about it is, is there are people out there that have a tremendous grasp of common sense doctrine. And they're not the PhDs when it comes to speaking, but they are when it comes to collecting all the data. And that's one of the things that you're going to want to find is the people that genuinely speak it. That's why I say it was such a blessing to find Barnhouse, to find a Presbyterian minister from the 50s that was so right down the line, Donald Gray Bar Barnhouse. And he is so phenomenal at, at presenting things in a common sense fashion that he was, he was spoken of by many, many people. Okay. So it's just, it's a beneficial thing. So, all right, now, here we go. We'll finish, we'll do 17. Um, we got through the definition, grace administered through the character of a person, essence of God. Um, love, motivation for grace. Justice is a function of grace. These are things that are on your very first pages of your Roman study because that'll be the righteousness and justice pages that you have. That's what this is, a, a little synopsis of that, okay? Adjustment to the justice of God, which is what you did at salvation. Number two is divine freedom to bless through grace without compromising any aspect of divine essence of God. He can bless you directly because you have adjusted to His justice, to His program, okay? You coming into union with Jesus Christ at salvation has adjusted you into God's blessing. Alright? Because the rest of the world, they're out there flapping their wings trying to figure out how to fly without feathers. And that's basically what the mouse do. Here's the deal. Blessing, salvation, repentance, which is rebound in, in themes words. Maturity, all point to grace. They are all administered by the Holy Spirit to you outside of you. You cannot get these on your own. They are totally given to you through the Holy Spirit and His program here on earth. All right. Then when it talks about divine justice demands that the integrity of God remain intact and divine justice administers what divine righteousness demands. Okay? How many of you know how to rationalize a situation to make your feelings feel fine? Everybody. <laughs> we can all go like this. It won't hurt you. Okay. Well, the problem is you've got a conflict going on internally all the time. All right? And the more you respond to the positive side, which is Christ, the less those battles are going to become violent. You will walk away from them much more readily as you continue to grow in Christ because you're not going to want the consequences, number one. You're not at all going to want what comes along with it, okay, as far as your feel. How many of you uh, wrestle with Romans 1, 8, 1 when it talks about there's no condemnation but you feel condemned sometimes? That is a rough wrestling match. That is something that takes time and maturity to get to the point where you realize that there is no condemnation out of Christ towards me when I make a mistake. It does not happen. That is totally you and your earth suit doing that. 
and you, you don't benefit yourself at all. Well, here's the deal. With all the rest of these down through here, it talks about 1 Peter 2, 24, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, and it all talks about the price that was pray, paid for your freedom. All right? And here it is. It's just the guilt of sinful human race then was transferred from each one of us to the Lord. This is talking about what this is what gospel is going to be. This is what you're going to tell somebody as to how they get themselves out of the bind and into freedom. All right? And it'll do that in Romans 5.12 and 6.23. Justice of God was propitiated by the efficacious work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay? In other words, his physical ability to go to the cross, die on the cross, have all of God's wrath poured out on him on the cross, dealt with every sin you ever committed prior to the cross. Now all you have to do is wrestle with the guys on the other side of the cross, which is 1 John 1.9. 1, okay? I don't give a rip if you're righteous. There's not all of you righteous. They're not totally righteous. There's pieces of you that stink. Okay? Whether you, you know, it may not be in the dark corners of a night, you might acknowledge them, but Christ knows them, but He doesn't care. Because He knows your heart. He knows what you did. He knows the fact you stepped into Him. That's what you're talking about here. Justice of God is now free to pardon and justify sinful mankind through man's non-meritorious response. That means you can't buy it. You can't get it in the mail. You can't go for the sale. You can't do anything. It is given to you because God decided to give it to you. <coughs> Gospel. Period. That's all it is. Over and over again. You don't have to make up a story. I was this and I was that. It doesn't matter. You. How many of you were just the best kids in the world when you grew up? <laughs> How many of you lied a lot when you were younger? Okay, I was just saying that. It's okay, I just want to make sure. So, you see, understand what I'm saying? There are some kids that are just really down the line. They do right. Okay? But they're not any different than the guy that does the worst. Alright? Because they have to be saved, just like all the rest. And that's basically what he's getting to with this. Now, it says, now you mature by the use of 1 John 1.9. Alright? This is a maturity thing. Immature people don't acknowledge their sins. Mature people do and walk on from them and learn from them. Okay? Mature by intake of doctrine. Alright? How do I grow you up in Christ? Continue to expound the Scriptures over and over and over and over. How many of you learn by repetition like old time school? I'm sorry, that's the best way. If I tell you once, I'm going to tell you a hundred times. The righteousness and justice of God is going to generate grace in you. It's going to. There, there is not a way in the world you can stop it. You're either going to be the most miserable Christian having it shoved into you, or you're going to be the most phenomenal Christian because you accept it willingly and you run with it. That's all there is to it. Okay? And that's basically where he's at. Now, as we keep on going with that verse, it says the righteousness for God in it is revealed. Okay, now something's going to be revealed. Revealing to you and I in scriptures means you're learning something. It talks about the mysteries of this and the mysteries of that all through the Bible. Mysteries of the church and all the other things. A mystery is something that has been revealed in scripture. Okay? And the thing of it is, with you and I, we have a tremendous backlog of information that the rest of the Christianity never had. So we can be benefited from it, okay? And it's telling you from faith as a source. The revealing has a source. Alright? And it's going to end up being your faith. Now, how many of you understand? How many of you have a handle on faith? <laughs> okay, here's the deal. This is you. You're a new Christian. And you got a nugget of faith. Why do I call it a nugget? Now, in Christ's eyes, you're just in the body and you got faith. That's how He sees you. Now, your job on planet Earth from the time you grasp Jesus Christ and come to Jesus Christ is taking this little package and transforming it into this package 
which you really and truly do have, but you have to grow into it. All right? Uh, when you build your house, okay, you got a set of plans. We do have a set of plans, right? Okay. You got a set of plans. Now, what does it take to turn that set of papers into a structure? Action. 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 And what else? People. Okay? It takes people. You can dump the two before, you can bring the concrete and just dump a big pile of it in the driveway. That's not going to be the slab for the house. That's going to be a concrete mountain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need a permit. They're, they're in that process. You have a permit? We're close. We're close. That's the blessing. <laughs> uh, come on, we're supposed to be lifting them up. Okay? Here's the deal. So what you have to understand is, here's you. Okay? Somebody's going to deliver concrete. Right, you already got your permit. How do you know I got your permit? Because you're a Christian. That means you got your permit. Here's the deal. They deliver a pile of concrete. What do you have to do? Somebody had to stop before the concrete truck shows up, throw all the footers around it, dig all the footers out, dig all the forms outside, footers out, put the steel in, put the chairs in, yada, 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 set the plumbing under the... All that had to be done ahead of time. Christ did all of that. He said, my walk to the cross gave you a foundation okay does that make sense so you don't ever have to worry about your foundation I don't have to worry about cracks I don't have to worry about settling I don't have to worry about anything because he said he did it so from that point on your job as a Christian is going to be to end up getting two by fours you're going to get ply you're going to get wire you got to get all of these things. You know what they all are? They're all doctrine. And every time you get a piece of doctrine, you build another piece of whatever it is you're going to be as a Christian in maturity. Okay? How do you keep the rain out? You put ply on the trusses, then you cover it with membrane, and then you put shingles on it. What is that to you? It tells you right on it. It's called the helmet of salvation. You see that? It comes back over and over. And there are people that can put this stuff together in a heartbeat. And, and they do it such a phenomenal way. And, and it's that material that survives the fire and flames when we enter into heaven. That's, there you that's, go. That's what we're building right there. Okay. And see what I'm saying? So that's why he, when he puts these things together this way, he says, I need you to realize you've got a source. The source has already put a lot of the groundwork in for you. And it says, the faith, which is believing, faith from salvation, adjustment to God, uh, the source of your, your faith is going to be the Holy Spirit. That's the one that's the interactor with you. That's the one that's going to play it. And then you've got three tenses of salvation. Yeah, three tenses of salvation. Okay? Understand that. Because here's the deal. This is a functioning, this is, you remember when I talked about an organism, something being alive? That's you. Here's the deal. I have been saved. Everybody in here can comfortably say, I've been saved. Okay? If you're lying, I don't care that you take it up with the big boy. Okay? But here's what it says. And it says, and what have you been saved from? A penalty of sin. So sin is not even a program of yours anymore. Other than the fact you're going to get out there and you're going to mess with it every now and again and you're going to run back and hide in the building. Okay? That's your job. I come back and hide in Christ every time I think I'm falling down. That's the deal. I'm being saved. How do we know that? Because he flat out told you. Okay? I'm going to continue this process, and this process is going to be continued how? What did Christ tell you about here for your salvation? Work it out. Work it out. Work it out. Okay? You, it's, it's that, that's, now, how do you work? How do you take the two before? You cut the strap, okay? And then when they all fall out of, out of the pretty package that you came, then you go around, you start laying them out, you throw out the 16-footers, you get your little speed square, and you go down, you mark your 16-inch centers, you notch out for the doors, whatever the doors are going to be, you cut the bottom of the frame so that when you stand it up, you don't cut the concrete with the sawzall when you go all the way through, okay? Now, you see how this program works? That's exactly what he's telling you. This is exactly how you're going to have this program work. And he says, now what have you been saved? What, what am I saving you from? I'm saving you from the power of sin. 
when the wind blows through and you've already got the building up, I can stand and look out through the hole, okay? And it's fine. The rain's out there and I'm in here. That's what he's talking about. And I shall be saved. The last part of this, and the thing of it is, is you're going to be saved from the very presence of sin. It will not be where I'm going. When I get to eternity, I never have to look under a rock to see if the next sin is there. It won't happen. Okay? That test, that trial, that verdict, it will all have been rendered and it will all be moot. Okay? That's just how he put it together. Alright, now here's the deal. If any one of these three are left out, there would be no reality of salvation. This is what your security is in. This is why you depend on the righteousness and justice of a God that's immutable and one that has a perfect, perfect batting score. Okay? And that's what it amounts to. And of what use is the remission of a penalty if one remains in the slavery of sin's actions? This is a question that can be asked by any Christian. Why are you beating yourself up over your salvation experience? And that's basically what you do when you say, oh my, I've sinned. It doesn't mean you want to be happy about it, but it do put it in its place and do respond to it correctly. Yes, I did. You died for that one on the cross. I am thankful to you for the fact that you died for that one on the cross and I could walk out without any penalty whatsoever from anything. Okay? There may be consequences to it. That is not a, that is not a problem to me. Why? Because God flat out said, those, them who He loves... He does what? Chastens. Okay? And that's before it was PC. I would still spank my kids today. I would be in jail. Okay? But I'm pretty, pretty confident in what I produced with Kathy and I and what we lived and how we showed them. Alright? So I'm saying that the plan that he put together, it works quite nicely. And it's a shame the world's digging it up, all right? Of what use is past and present work of salvation if it is not to be continued to the logistical fulfillment in heaven? Why, this is the question I ask, why am I studying so long? Why am I learning Greek at such a late age? Why am I doing this? Why am I doing that? What is the purpose of it? Is eternity going to be really there when I get in that? Well, here's the deal. Those are normal questions. You're not abnormal if you ask them. And it says here, continue to logis uh, logical fulfillment in heaven if there were a complete triumph of righteousness and joy shall be ours forevermore in perfection of circumstances and capacity. How many of you realize that you don't even have the capacity to love and be joyful to the extent you will when you step into heaven? How many of you, uh, let me think of this. Uh, how, many, how many people have ever bought a brand spanking new car? I never have. I, I, I'm hoping there's something in heaven that's comparable to that. <laughs> okay, I don't know what the smell of new car is. Mine usually smells like socks. <laughs> the windows are now and they're not new. Not, not new socks, no. Not new socks at all, okay? But the thing of it is, is you, 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 you know, the, you, you understand the feeling that I'm, that I'm trying to convey? Well, that, that, is, that is what it, it's going to be like in heaven. When you get there and realize, I thought I could be happy. But this is a happiness that's beyond what I ever, ever, ever dreamt. Contentment that is beyond what I ever knew contentment could be. And I mean, if I'm sitting out, when I used to have the Greenhead Mallards, and I was sitting on the dock and out back at the shop on the, on the porch or whatever, and it was just the sun just coming up, and I was rattling the food bag, and those birds came looping around two or three times. They came sitting in on the pond in the morning. I mean, you, you could have just flipped and raptured me right there. I could have been, I would have been fine for the rest of eternity. Okay, but what I'm saying is, whatever I felt that is going to be exponentially myriads beyond that when I get to heaven. And to me, that's just, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, that's going to be fun stuff. When your rocket goes off and it gets to where it's supposed to be going, you have a rocket. Rocket <laughs> <laughs> rocket? That's a, that's a cross rocket. That's one job. So. Okay. No, but when it gets to where it's going, don't all the people go, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're all going, I've seen them with the shuttle, and when they came back after the guys got messed up at the moon, and people were jumping all over the Everlovers control room. Why? 
That's joy. Honest to God, unfettered joy that is exponentially less than what God could produce. But it's still there. So he gives us indications of it. All right? So, at any rate, now, where are we at now? 43. We get to go to 44. Okay. Now. Um, part of this is just stuff that you can check on your own because it, and it says as has been written, okay? As it has been written. In other words, it stands already done. And it talks about Habakkuk, the Old Testament canon. The Spirit breathed it out. It tells you how you got the canon of Scripture, okay? And then it was perfect passive indicative. What does that mean? Okay, what's that mean? A point of time, something that happened totally by God, okay, with the, with, with the program that is going to happen. It's, it becomes reality. All right, that's what they're talking about when it talks about the Spirit breathing something out. All right? You and I do that with... Uh, how can, what would be a good example of that? Um, okay. When um, Josh just got another, a new truck. Came down here, got a new truck. All right? And... When, I, when he got the truck, he did something. He signed the paper, okay? And he said, here it is. Everything's going fine. A point in time. Everything's great. And he said, now I'm going to give it and park it in our driveway till Christmas. He only drew, drove it for 15 minutes, okay? That's basically what it amounts to with this stuff. Did he leave you the keys? Keys, yeah. <laughs> Two sets. The brand new? I mean, it's brand spec. I don't know. I think it might be a year or so. I don't know. It's, it still smells it. like the one he's talking about. Yeah, <laughs> and it's it's very 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 pretty truck. All kinds of bells and whistles on it would scare me to death. But it's fine. But the thing is, is that's what he did, and that's exactly what it amounts to here. Holy Spirit breathed it out, put it into action, and then pulled back and said, "Okay, now until the church shows up, I don't have a job. But now my job is to make you guys understand what you got." And that's basically what it amounts to. It has been written. In other words, it stands already done. Okay? And it says the now, and the way they're weird, it's kind of weird, but the now is a contrast to set up. Unbelievers are failing. Self-righteousness is going to creep in. All of these things are going to take place. And the thing about it is, with everything Paul's telling them, he says, I'm going to show you. I'm going to take, I've shown you righteousness over the, over the first handful of, verses, especially 16 and 17. Now I'm going to take you to another page. I'm going to show you what happens after the fact. And here's the perpetuation for adjustment to the justice of God. This is a little deal right here when it talks about Habakkuk, the 241. Behold, his soul that is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith, by his faith in doctrine. Now what it amounts to is you are a broken entity that has been indwelled by a perfect creature that will allow you to grow because of the doctrine that you will feed the inserted part. Okay? That's basically what he's talking about here. And the translation, Behold, regarding the arrogant believer, okay, his soul is not right within him. Now why are we saying that? Because there's times when you go, you go negative. That's why 1 John says, alright, I'll, I'll deal with that unrighteousness for you. Okay? He says, I'll do it. It's going to be showing up. And that's what they're talking about here. Now, I'm talking about somebody that's in blatant sin. I'm talking about somebody that's niggling around the edges of something that does not quite know what, you know, that he's crossed over the line. And that's basically what he's talking about. It says, but the believer will live by his faithfulness to doctrine. You've just got a either or. You've got a believer that is going to be self-righteous and you've got a believer that's going to be faithful to the righteousness of God. Now, you see a transition about to happen. There's going to have to be something done with that group of people that are not doing it God's way, and there's going to be something done to the ones that are doing it God's way. And that's basically what he's doing here. And it says, when you flip over to the says, he said in Habakkuk 2 4, it talks about the adjustment. And it says, the just man, buy, okay? That doesn't mean you go out and buy some of this stuff and get faith on your own. It says, buy, and it means source. It says, so in other words, 
The faith that you have out from Christ is what's going to trigger you to get things done. And that's what he's talking about here. And it says faith, and that to you and I is going to be the daily intake of doctrine. I don't care how you get it. You can get it on the radio. You can get it on your iPad. You can get it on a book. You can get it on a pamphlet. You can get it on a bumper sticker. I don't give a rip how you get it. It's going to be in front of you somewhere. Okay? That's going to be His job. The Holy Spirit's going to put you in a position where you can derive truth wherever you are. Alright? And it says, and it, by faith you're going to live. People that are walking out there without Jesus Christ don't even realize they're dead. They have no clue. Whereas you guys are on the other page. You're walking around and everybody looks at you and thinks you're like everybody else until they start paying attention to the details of you. And when they pay attention to the details, they see that you are a little bit off top dead center to the world. And what happens when they notice that? They can respond positively or they can respond negatively. It's entirely up to you. Okay? Uh, how many of you... The Jehovah Witness guy didn't come back. I waited for him. I thought for sure he'd be there. With his armies, but he didn't show up. So I'll, I'll just fold something up and stick it in a tube there by the by the wall. And when he shows up, I'll pull him out. So at any rate, it says, it says you're going to live. And it says by doctrine. You have to understand, here's the deal with you. You are the vindicated ones. That is your tag. Okay? Satan's going to come up and point at her and say, you're disgusting this week. And then Christ is it. He's standing right there at the throne. Sitting right next to God. He gets up, goes over to God, and whispers in his ear, I'm sorry, that one belongs to me. That stuff won't stick. And then Satan's ticked. So what does Satan do? Do you think he just runs off? Oh, no. This is when he goes out and sets up a couple more traps. Why? Because you've already been talked about in heaven by Christ, which automatically puts you on the hit list. Okay? And if you're on the hit list, how many of you go, oh my God, I don't want to be on the hit list. What does a functioning Christian in Christ say in that scenario? Yay, I'm on the hit list. I am tickled about being on the hit list because I am on the right path. Holds up the shield. Yeah, exactly. It's not like I'm going out there with nothing. All right? I've got the whole shooting match at my disposal. Not to mention, I've got angels watching over me. I mean, they got jobs. I mean, when they see my name on the chart on the front side of a week, I'll bet you they're passing it off. Oh, you don't want to go with that one. He's always in a bind. And then somebody says, I'll take that one. I'll take that one. I'll take that one. And that's basically what it amounts to. Why? Because they have the information I need. They are the ones with me. They're the ones parting everything out of the way till I get to the one to the regular battle that I have to get to. And that's what it's talking about here. Vindicated ones, function of life, manner of life. That's how it's exhibited in me. Okay? I have to do it on a more consistent basis. Always you want to be more consistent. That's the deal. Alright? And it talks about that in Timothy. Now. You're about out of time. I know I am out of time and we're out of pages. So we can start the next chunk. Okay? And I'll copy this. Because this is going to give you the transition from 17 to 18 because you're now going to see God's protocol. Alright? He doesn't leave anything unattended. So He is now done teaching you righteousness. He's done teaching you salvation. And He is now going to show you a little, just a little inkling of the wrath side. Okay? So that's we'll start with that next week with 18. And we'll go from there. Alright? You got your thing, I did. Did you get the machine to work? Nope. Nope. Okay. All right. um, I've got Steve, Lisa, Myra, Melissa, Pam, Ken, Ralph, Debbie, Carol Lee. Anybody else you can think of when we put them on the, the list for wrestling with cancer or getting over cancer or whatever the case might be. I've got the service and the staff. I put another request in for cool weather. I don't know whether it would be answered or not. Oh, we got Shirley and Larry, but we got the real we got the real Shirley and Larry right here. So it's good to see you. Now, you want to talk. 
Go ahead and talk, and then I'll finish this. All right. All right. It's been a long time coming, <laughs> but I'm here, and I wanted to thank everybody for your prayers. Your prayers. Yes, ma'am. Because it was working. It was working. And I want to thank everyone for bringing the food to the house. Something I've never had done before. And I tell you, that was a blessing. It was a blessing that I can't even begin to tell you. I wasn't able to do it. <laughs> and so to stand too long, I'd have to go slam. But anyway, I want to thank everybody for all that they did. And the food was delicious. If I couldn't eat it, he did. <laughs> Sometimes my stomach is a little bit wheezy because I had an inflammation in the hospital. And uh, that's remember, probably when we heard Larry Howard at the top things. of his lungs. Yeah. Sure, we can't eat it. I get it all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but okay, I really want to thank you and really express that amount of enough that I do. And I really thank every one of you. Well, I think you're corporately welcome. Yeah. Every time you left the house, uh -oh. I would say, Lord, bless them. Bless them good. <laughs> and I just hope you felt that. I really hope you felt Is that what was pushing me down the road? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> Oh. You're very welcome. Thank you. I'm glad we could do it. Oh, and I forgot. Fun. Yes, ma'am. I had two important people that I forgot. Oh, yes, ma'am. When was Mary Ann and Lynn right. and Bobby? Uh oh. We're getting all of us together to have the people come to the house and do the things. Thank you. You're very welcome. And Mary Ann had said, well, I will drive you where you need to go. But Lynn got sucked in. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn got sucked in. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It was a pleasure. <laughs> 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 yes, I really thank both of you. Yes, ma'am. You just caught us on a good day. Not a problem. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Um, we got Shirley, daughter-in-law, Claudia, uh med is not doing anything for the cancer and we'll need to start something different she Stay. had uh, breast breast cancer okay all right and it has gone into her wounds okay all right. and uh she's been on medicine for i don't know how long and now that isn't doing anything okay. and the tumors are getting bigger okay all right then we'll put we're on the everyday prayer list. All right. Pastor Earl Stovall and family lost their mother Tuesday. And then Reba Bingard? Vineyard? Yeah, Vineyard. Jim's mother in law. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Uh huh. Okay. All right. And then we got another one here. Cousin in Michigan with diabetes and other health problems. Friend whose cancer has returned. Norma. Okay. Tom and Edith Lamb, thanks for praying. Tom had a good and relatively safe, relatively safe trip. <laughs> the pavilion in Delaware was shown to the first prospective buyer. That's a good thing. Lois, pray for Ned Mervis family. Is that correct? Yeah. Ned is in hospice, dying of leukemia. He's an old family friend. And Eva, brother-in-law, Rob, went on hospice. He's 47. Okay. All right. We'll do it. Bobby? Yes, sir, sir. That project. Uh, yes, sir. 11? Yeah, the hoedown is uh, next Saturday night. If any of you have ever wanted 17. to go on a mission and never done it, this is an opportunity to drive 40 minutes instead of getting on an airplane. And a uh, blessing that all the uh, students over at UCF. All right. There you go. We're going to help serve and clean up the normal work. All right, let's pray and I'll turn you loose. Thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for the blessing. We thank you for your word. 
pray that the Holy Spirit challenges us with whatever we said, that you used wisely during the course of the week and allow them to enjoy the, the program of studying your word and, and watching you come alive through it. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.